Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Now we're glad to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. We do have the number of visitors. We're glad you're here. We always welcome our visitors here at Northside. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the next hour we can be an inspiration to you. In the absence of Paul this morning, Brother Gibson is directing the singing. So you out there in the auditorium and the choir turn to page 308. Page 308, the lifeboat. And sing this number out for the first one today. So Brother Gibson at this time.
the Lord Jesus Christ is our ark, our ark of safety. I hope you're in him. You're saved, you are. So that's wonderful. If you're not saved, you need to get saved because you're treading on dangerous ground. Now, one of our young ladies, Miss Judy Campbell, is going to sing for us at this time. She's going to sing the beautiful number entitled Whispering Hope, accompanied at the piano by Debbie Allen. So Judy will come around and sing for us at this time.
Thank you, Judy and Debbie. That was very beautiful, and we appreciate it so very much. Take your Bible, will you please, and turn to Matthew chapter 5, page 999 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Matthew chapter 5. While you're turning there, I'd like to say something pertaining to our broadcast. We're heard every day, Monday through Saturday, on the station at 12 noon. And we're taping our Sunday night messages as well as the Sunday morning messages now because we bring in a series on the 23rd Psalm. And tonight we'll be on the fifth message in the 23rd Psalm, message number five. We'll have at least 12 messages on the 23rd Psalm when we finish. And they will be available. And I'd like to urge you to pray for me and write to me during these hot summer days and vacationing time. Seem like people forget about the broadcast. It makes it hard on me to try to keep it on there financially. And I need to hear from you. I need your concern. I need your prayers. I need your support. And a word to the wise is sufficient. And so you pray for me. I have many tapes available. By getting as many as 10, they're $4 each. You get as many as 20, they're $3 each. If you get one, uh, between one and 10, they'll be for a $5 gift on the broadcast. And the, uh, the gift is used to help take care of the radio expense. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. If you'd like to have our brochure pertaining to our proposed Holy Land tour, then you request it. Call me, come by and see me. I'd be glad to supply you with the brochure to the Holy Land tour. Now, Matthew chapter 5, and beginning with verse 13. Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his Savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I'm speaking to you today on this subject, why Christians are called salt. Now this will be tape number 84, why Christians are called salt. Now we had a lot, have a lot of evil in the land today, and were it not for the Christian people in the world today, God would strike this earth in judgment. Uh, he said, ye are the soul to the earth. You're preserving, you're keeping the wrath of God from striking this earth. We have a lot of evil in the land today. Many years ago, Henry VIII, they pardoned a man for killing someone in cold-blooded murder. He pleaded for mercy. Henry VIII pardoned this man. And this man went out and killed a second man. They brought him once again before Henry VIII and said, Sir, would you have mercy on this man again and pardon him from this crime? He said, absolutely not. He said, this man is guilty of killing the first man. But he said, I am guilty of killing the second man because I pardoned him. Now we have an doing everything they can to free these criminals. They're, it's a pro-crime organization. And they'll face God in the judgment with blood dripping from the hands of innocent victims on the earth. Henry VIII had enough sense to know that he was guilty. A lot of people don't have that much sense. Some of these crooked judges and lawyers and spineless jurors don't realize that every time they set a criminal free or reduce his crime or keep him out of the electric chair when he should be put to death and he commits another crime, they are partly guilty or maybe fully guilty of the crime themselves. And they'll answer for it in the day of judgment when they face God Almighty. They need to wake up and realize that. You can't play around about this crime business today. Our judicial system's in, in shambles. It's a, it's a joke. It's a laughing stock to the world. And our leaders that have the authority and can do something about it needs to do something about it and not play around with politics and ignore it. Now, in the Bible, you have many personal names in the Bible. Jesus referred to his people by many personal names, such as sheep. They were called sheep. And, of course, you have the name serpents in the Bible, referring to some uh, evil people. You have sand in the Bible, referring to multitudes. You have stars, referring to multitudes of people. You have seed in the Bible, that refers to uh, uh, God's people, of course. You have salt here. 
that refers to the people of God, relates to these that know God, that are saved, of course. And why are Christian people called salt? Now, God didn't put this in the Bible to fill up space. He put it in the Bible for a real purpose, a real meaning. And I want to point out several reasons why Christians are called salt. Number one, salt will counteract leaven. The Bible tells you in Leviticus chapter 2 and verse 13 that every oblation of thy meat offering thou shalt season with salt. Neither shall thou suffer the salt of the covenant to thy God to be lacking for the meat offering. And with all thy offerings thou shalt offer salt. Now salt here counteracts leaven. And Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. Talking about you saved people, you're the real salt of this earth. And you're to counteract sin. Sin is a type of, uh, leaven is a type of sin. And every Christian should be an antidote to sin. That was a little boy one time, he went fishing on Sunday. And people should not go fishing on Sunday. It's still a sin for Christian people to go fishing on Sunday. It's wrong. It should not be done. It's a sin to do so. And this little boy went fishing on Sunday and when he should have been in Sunday school in church and on the way back he had a string of fish and he met his pastor coming from the church and of course the very presence of the man of God counteract what he had done, the sin he had committed that day by going fishing instead of being in God's house. And so he hid his fish behind him but when he met his pastor he, he just surmised the pastor discovered the fish and he pulled him out in front of me, he said, Pastor, I wish you'd look what these fish got into by biting bait on Sunday. See, we always went in to pass the buck and say someone else is guilty or someone else's fault. But the little fellow, if he'd have been in Sunday school and church like he should have, the poor fish wouldn't have been biting that bait on Sunday. And so the presence of the man of God counteracted the evil that this young boy did on that day. Then number two, salt in the bloodstream sustains life. People that perspire freely learn to take salt tablets many times to help them maintain salt in their bloodstream. When I was in basic training in World War II in Camp Landing, Florida, the hottest place on the earth, I thought at that time in the months of, uh, months of July and August and so forth, I thought that was the hottest place I'd ever seen in my life. We were taking training, crawling on our stomachs in hot black sand and, and going through swamps and it was turbo. And they would trot us and march us all the morning. And then they'd march us in occasionally into the mess hall. And we'd be so thirsty until we could hardly breathe, seemed like, or just about to pass out. And they'd give us some salt tablets and give us some hot chocolate or hot, hot coffee to drink. We were hoping to get some cold water or iced tea, but no, we had to drink the hot coffee or the hot chocolate and take the salt tablets. That was turbo. And they said, this is for your good. And it was. They knew what they were doing. Because if you lose a certain amount of salt in your body, you're in trouble. And so salt in the bloodstream sustains life. And you will find that likewise, Christians in any community, our nation sustains life in that particular community. You are the real life. I mean true Christian life. And you are the real salt. And you are the light of the world in your community. I would not want to live in a nation where there's no saved people whatsoever. I'm glad that we live in America where we still have some true Christians. I know we live in a very weakened nation. I realize that, committing sins far more than many other nations. But anyway, the Christian people, they sustain life in that community. As I said earlier, were it not for the true born-again believers, in this world or in this nation, God will strike her in judgment immediately. That's why God will strike the nation in judgment and the world in judgment after they're gone. When God lifts out his people, the salt of the earth at the rapture, then the old earth is going to spoil. God will strike her in judgment. Number three, we know that salt saves by contact. Now, I was a country boy. You can tell that by my preaching, I'm sure. By the way I act and the way I look, I assume. But... Anyway, I was born and read in the country, and I'm proud of it. I'm glad I grew up as a country boy because the blading of a calf, the lowing of a cow, the cackling of a hen, the crowing of a rooster, the barking of a dog uh, will put something in you that a cotton mill whistle will never put into you. And so I, I was glad that I was born and reared in the country. In those days, we'd have hog-killing time in the fall of the year, in the winter time. 
And my parents and my grandparents and the neighbors, on hog killing time, they would kill those big old nice hogs and cut out those hams and they would put them in a box and they would put salt in that box and salt over that ham. And then about six months or maybe even a, a nine months later, uh, whenever we got ready to eat that good old country ham, it was really good. It was right there. It had been preserved. Now what preserved that ham? That good old salt they put in there. That did it. That salt kept that ham from spoiling. Had that ham been placed in that meat box without any salt on it, it was spoiled. And a short time thereafter, it was the salt that did the job. And so we know then that salt preserves, and salt, of course, by its contact, will keep certain things alive, and so Christians are likewise. By your contact, by what you do as a Christian, keeps things moving on on the right track. Then number four, salt is used in tempering steel. They tell me when they temper steel, they use salt to temper that steel. Now Christians sometimes have developed irritating characteristics uh, that must be moved and their lives made blessing and many times God will allow certain things to happen to kind of temper you get some salt in your uh, sore spots so to speak in your scratches or your cuts or bruises kind of burns but it, it is used to temper you to kind of straighten you out there may be some of you right now you love the Lord but somebody gets in your hair once in a while they rub you wrong they really get salt in your bruises and cuts and they disturb you and just ties you up sometimes to be in their presence. God may use that very thing to temper you and to make you the kind of person you ought to be. Old John Wesley had a wife, mean as a devil. She was meaner than Xantippe, the wife of Socrates. And there old John Wesley, whenever he would pass by the window where his wife was in the kitchen, and he'd have his Bible, she had raised the devil so he couldn't study and pray in his house. He'd walk up and down the road. And as he came by, she had dash some dishwater, throw something at him as he'd pass by the window. She was the very devil. And old John Wesley had to live with that, but he kept him on his knees and kept him humble before God. Now, a lot of times God will allow you to be associated with someone, uh, maybe put you on the job with someone, or have you to do business with someone, uh, put someone as your neighbor, that really keeps you upset and irritated and worried and sometimes fighting mad. Now, if you'll stay low before God, God will use that to temper you and make you the kind of Christian you ought to be. If everything ran along smoothly, you wouldn't develop as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Now, when I was in the army and taking basic training, we, we uh, jumped off of houses, climbed trees, jumped out of trees, jumped over ditches, uh, thrown into ponds of water, I mean, we were just treated rough, terribly rough. And down there in Florida, it rained about four or five times a day. It would have a big old heavy raincoat, and they'd let us get soaking wet, and the sun come out burning hot, and they'd say, all right, men, put your raincoats on. After we got soaking wet, we had to put the raincoats on. They did that deliberately. Made it as rough as they could, and we'd wear them hot things for a while. But anyway, when I left from down there, I could run many miles, 10 miles easy without stopping, and uh, I was strong physically, and they shot me to the battlefront, and I came out of that hot climate, and they sent me on the front lines, and I had to go on the lines in, in snow and had a white sheet, oh, sheet, sheet over my body when I left the jeep to go to the lines to keep the enemy from uh, seeing me as I went through that snow to the foxholes. Well, I was ready for it. I could take it because of the training. Had I not had that rugged training, I could not have made it. I could not have slept on the ground, eat out of tin cans, fought men, and, and uh, jumped over gullies and went, run through windows and buildings and cleared out villages and things of that type and lived that rugged life, didn't know one day from another, and moving on fighting day. And I couldn't have done it had I not had the basic training. Now, God knows what you need, and God knows how to put salt in your cuts and bruises. And God knows who and what and how you can be kept on your knees. And if you stay on your knees and the old salt is rubbed in, it'll make a good Christian out of you. Number five, salt crystals are perfectly square. Now, a salt crystal is perfectly square. Now, you keep that in mind. It speaks of a Christian's life, measuring up to his testimony, true and square, knowing the breadth, length, depth, height, and the love of Christ. And so that should be some characteristics in your life, manifested in your life every day. 
Number six, we find that salt is a thirst inducer. Now you can drink a lot of salt and, or eat a lot of salt rather than make you want to drink and make you thirsty. I remember my father back on a farm, if he had a, a mule or a horse that didn't like to drink or didn't want to drink water like he should, he'd give him some salt, cows likewise. And after they'd eat that salt, they'd head for the, the watering tub. They you had no problem with them then. That salt would cause them to become thirsty. Now Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Now as a Christian, you ought to influence others to want to be more like Jesus. Dr. Hyman Alpman, that Jewish evangelist, went on to be with the Lord just a few weeks ago. Won many souls to God. One day he sat on the same platform with Dr. George W. Truett. Dr. Hammond Alpman said, you know, I sat there, I can't explain how I felt, but I just felt like I was in the presence of Jesus Christ. That man of God sitting there, a holy, righteous man of God with the power of the Holy Ghost on him, he said, I felt like I was in the presence of Jesus. And that made him want to be more like Dr. Truett. Now, as a Christian, we should act and conduct ourselves in such a manner that other Christians' people will say, well, I'd like to be more like that person. That person is Christ-like. That person loves the Lord. And I really would like to be more like that person. And we, we can be, as we strive, more like Jesus every day. In Isaiah chapter 44 and verse 3, he said, I'll pour water upon him this thirst and flood upon the dry ground. The only way other Christian people are going to become real thirsty is for you as the salt have influence over them. And as you have influence over them, they're going to desire to be more like Jesus and desire to create a thirst in the lives of others. Why do we need, need to do that? When I was a young minister, just started out of the ministry on in Greenville, South Carolina, there's a young layman saved over there. That man loved God. He was such a blessing. Not a preacher, just a lay speaker. But he was busy conducting prayer meetings and speaking wherever he had a chance to do so. And he served God faithfully for a matter of a few years and died suddenly and went on to be with God. But he was one of the greatest Christians you ever knew. And when you'd go to a prayer meeting after he had gone on to be with the Lord, you could just mention his name. And a holy hush would come over that crowd. Just mention his name would humble their hearts and make them want to be more like Jesus. My high created thirst in the hearts and lives of others. Then we find that soul to the sign of a covenant. Ancients could not kill a man with whom they'd eaten salt. Now the presence of a Christian is proof of a covenant keeping God who declared, Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Every time you see a Christian, that reminds you of God's covenant that Him that cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. So you must keep that in mind. Number eight, salt is a healing application. Back as a little boy growing up, and I still do it today. If I contract her sore throat, I, I get me some warm water and some, put some salt in it and goggle my throat, and, and it helps it. It feels better. As a little boy growing up, I had a turbo boil on one of my thighs, and, and it was almost as big as a hen egg. And the old doctor came, and he lynched that boil, and then he put a salt police on that thing to dry out all the poison out of that ball. I mean, it drew it out. That salt police did the job. I don't know what all they had in it. Maybe meal and salt and whatnot. But it most certainly did the job. There's something about salt that's healing. It heals in many different ways. We as a Christian should impart healing to the sowing spirit, the sick at heart, and the weary ones under sin's bondage. Every Christian should be so salty, as it were, that when you meet another Christian, if they're having problems, they're in trouble, that just your very presence and just a few words from you ought to be a healing process for them. It ought to do something for them. If not, then we're not living like we should. If you're the type of person when you leave, they say, I'm sorry I met that fellow. Day is not my day. I just guarantee you, day is not my day. I, why do I have to meet that person? Now, that means you're about to run out of salt. Now, if you're the type kind of Christian you should be to be around that person that's having problems, Maybe problems in the home, problems on the job, problems in the business, problems in the community, uh, maybe in ill health. Just your very presence should help that individual. If your very presence as a Christian don't do it, you're not the kind of a Christian that you ought to be. You just have maybe some form of religion and really not with God like you ought to be. 
That was a little girl one time that went to spend uh, the, a summer vacation out in the country with her old uncle and aunt. And her parents told her, and I said, before you go, I want you to know they're real religious, real religious people. And she said, all right. And she went out in the country, and they were real sour looking. Uh, just looked like uh, every day is going to be the last on the earth. Very seldom ever spoke, just sat around with a long face. The little girl couldn't understand it. The next day she went down behind the barn and there stood an old mule about ready to drop dead and it barely strong enough to carry him up the sack on its back and that old mule was standing there head almost touching the ground with walled eyes just about ready to fall over and that little girl said well I see that Uncle ain't not the only one has got religion I see you have religion too there Mr. Mule now beloved the way we act the way we look what we do many times if we say we're Christians if it's not the kind it ought to be, then it's a hindrance and cause others to falter and fall by the wayside. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. I don't have time to get into that. There's a sermon there within itself about the Good Samaritan, what he did, how he helped that person along the way. Now, salt is a flavor of. Now, without salt, food would be flat, unappetizing. I, I, I got, got to have a little salt on, on my food. I just, just like it. I, I like to go to the tomato patch and get me a good old, big old ripe tomato and carry my salt and pepper along and, and eat it in the tomato patch. I used to do that as a boy. I still like to do that. I like salt on my food. I know many times you have high blood pressure, maybe a diabetic or something or other. You can't eat a lot of salt, but uh, food without salt is just too flat for me. I like salt. Maybe I eat too much salt. I don't know. But it flavors the food. And a Christian... That's not walking with God and walking in the Spirit is like food without salt. You're just not a blessing. You're not helpful. People just don't desire to be around you too much. No Christian should have a colorless and helpless life. It should be uh, colored in, in, in respect to Christianity. It should be helpful. It should be a life that people would appreciate you and love to see you and like to be around you and like to have your fellowship. Nobody likes to be around an old, bilious, crabby uh, fellow with a dura expression on his face and look like he's going to snap your head off when you speak to him. Who wants to be around a jaybird like that? Not me. I don't hang around people like that too long at a time. I always have an excuse to get going. I like to be around people that will help you, be a blessing to you, that's uplifting, that's kind, that's nice. And when you leave them, you can say, well, I'm glad I met him today. He just made my day. You know, that's wonderful. That's the kind of salt you ought to be. It, it has a flavor. And you as a Christian, if you don't add a little flavor to make others a little better along the way, you're missing the mark. You're missing the mark. Your salt, your salt is a low ebb, spiritually speaking. You need to get a little more salt in your system. And then we know salt is scattered through food. You don't pour all your salt in one place. I was sitting in a cafe one day and some devilish boys sitting in a booth nearby and when they got through ready to go they just uh, un un unscrewed the salt cap on top of the salt shaker and, and just set it back on top of the salt shaker and then when the next person came in got ready to salt his food he poured the whole container full right on his little plate of food there now that, that's meanest now that should not have been done I'm not talking about that kind of, of Christianity but it should be sprinkled around Sprinkle on the food. And that's the way God plants his children. He'll plant some here, some over yonder, some in other places. And plants them around in the world as lights, as salt. Salt needs to be sprinkled. And you might be surprised how God has sprinkled his salt over the world. Yonder in Germany, he sprinkled a little. Over in England, he sprinkled some. You know, in Australia, you sprinkle some. In Japan, you sprinkle some. Here in America, you sprinkle some. God has sprinkled the salt around for a purpose to flavor the situation. And were it not for that, we'd have no flavor. Life would be miserable. Paul tells us, you know, if we have no hope of God, we've all been most miserable. And then salt cleanses. You ever brush your teeth with salt and soda? You ought to do that once in a while. I'm not a dentist, but... You ought to do that. That's good for your teeth, good for your gums. Brush your teeth with salt and soda occasionally. And that would be good for your teeth. Now, salt cleanses. Sometimes it will cleanse your teeth, your mouth, your gums, where maybe just plain water would not, or maybe even toothpaste would not. 
Use it once in a while as a cleansing element. And as Christian people, we should live clean, pure, holy, and our influence should have a clean influence upon others to the glory of God. Then finally, salt is preservative. You know, God told Abraham, he said, Abraham, if I find a certain number of people in Sodom and Gomorrah, I'll spare those weaker cities. Start off with 50. Abraham drew him down to, to 10. And God said, if I find 10 righteous people in Sodom and Gomorrah, then I'll spare those cities. Abraham said, now let me see. There's so and so and so and so. Oh yeah, that's a yeah. Lot's got at least 10 in his family. I'm safe. I won't have to worry because I know it's at least 10 in Lot's family. And I'm all right now. And so uh, Abraham stopped reducing God down. And Abraham, knowing the truth about the matter, he got him down to five, a four, a three, a one, a two, a one, rather than have him destroyed. But he said, no, Lot down there has got ten in his family. He's one his in-laws to God. He's got his children to God. His wife knows God. He knows God. There's ten of them down there at least. But the next morning when Uncle Abraham walked out of his tent, he saw smoke boiling up out of Sodom and Gomorrah. God already dropped the atomic bomb. And that atomic bomb hit Sodom and Gomorrah and burned her up and burned the people up. And Lot and his wife and two daughters finally got out. And his wife was not believing. She turned and looked back and God congealed her, turned her into a pillow of salt. All of his other children, his in-laws, died in Sodom. He didn't have ten. Now had he had ten there, they would have preserved. Salt is preserving. And did you know that salt, God's people, are the ones that's preserving this earth today? Now maybe some of you unbelievers and infidels and atheists, agnostics and Go devils and whatnot out there listen to me in the radio listen to artists that don't believe that. But you better believe that. Were it not for the born again Christian people on this earth, God would strike her in judgment. And you ought to appreciate the people of God. I know many people hate God's people, but you better appreciate them. Were it not for God's people, you'd be burning in hell if you're an unbeliever, a God hater. Because it's the Christian people that's keeping the wrath of God from falling on this earth. Jesus said, ye are the salt of the earth. And that's what you are. Let's stand up. Our Father, I pray today that you help us realize our responsibility, our obligation as being salt of the earth and what it means and stands for. We don't want to lose our savor. You tell us if the salt loses its strength, then it's no good. Just made to put in a path and trampled over by men. Lord, help us to be salty salt to the glory of God. Had you in this invitation, speak to the radio and listen audience, I pray. May Jesus be honored. And always say, do I pray in his name. Amen. Debbie's going to play for us. And while she's playing, if there's anyone here that's unsaved, backslidden on God, want to join this church the way we receive members, of any other reason you need to come forward, you may respond. While she plays a couple, of, while we say, what you got? 385. 385. I didn't notice Brother Gibson back there. 385. Let's sing a stanza so. While we sing a stanza so, would you obey? If God is speaking, if God is speaking, would you come? That's enough singing. I appreciate your presence today. I want you to come back tonight. We won't keep you long. We start at 6. We'll let you out around 7. You'll have two or three hours before dark. 
We want you to come for Jesus' sake. Come to the glory of God. Be here. If you're a member of this church, you visitors, we'd be glad to have you. But be back tonight if you possibly can, and we appreciate it so very much.